Okay, so we're live. Don't say anything you don't want anyone else to hear. Okay, especially Zara. Never know who's watching. <laughs> from Lassim 2.22, which is Reish Chaf Bet in the Kutay Moran, the first part. So 2.22, that's also Rechev, which is Hebrew for a car. So maybe this lesson will carry us someplace. Bezat Hashem. <clears throat> um, this is a short lesson, so then after the lesson I've got two stories, two personal stories, and then a bit of a long but really amazing Hasidic story. A person always has to be joyful and to serve Hashem with joy. Right? We say in the morning, Ivdu at Hashem Basimcha. It says Mizmola uh, Toda or Mizmola Soda, depending on what's on your mind. And thank Hashem for thinking of drinking Coca Cola, Mizmola Soda. So it says, Ibda Deshem Vesimcha, and every time people like to say to me, So what do you do? I said, I say, Ani Avot Deshem Vesimcha. I serve Hashem Vesimcha. It's uh, never so simple to say what I do. I do internet marketing, but all kinds of things. And also, they usually ask me on Shabbos, and I never want to talk about it on Shabbos. So I just say, Ani Avot Deshem Vesimcha. Tzarich Tamid Leot Vesimcha, or Avot Deshem Vesimcha. So I always have to be joyful and to serve Hashem with joy. And even if sometimes a person falls from that level, right, you can't be happy right that second, or you're not as happy as you'd like to be. So, what do you do when things aren't going so well at that moment? You have to hold on. You have to strengthen yourself in those days when a little bit of Hashem's light was shining on you, right? So you feel like now you're kind of depressed, you're in the darkness. So you strengthen yourself by remembering the good times, when things were going well for you. Kamoshanu sumim machazikim atzman 
שאינו סומה ומאמינים בו והולכים אחריו. Just like we see sometimes <coughs> that there's a group of blind people. Blind? Blind. Sum, סומים או בליינד, סומה. We'll move this a little bit. כמו שאנו רואים כמה סומים. So we see some blind people and they're holding on one to the other in a line and the one who's in front, the blind person in front, he believes that the person that he's holding on to can actually see. Right? Have you ever seen this before? I've seen it in the shuk. They, they hold on to each other's shoulders and you'll see like five or six people and there's one person in front and he's the one who's guiding them. But if you're blind, you can't know if the person in front can really see. You're just assuming that he can see. But they believe it. Yesh le'em emuna. They believe that the person in front can see and that he's taking them <coughs> where they're supposed to go. And also the person who's behind the first person and the second person, they believe that they're all holding on to somebody who's taking them where they need to go and they all believe that the person in front can see. And also, sometimes a blind person is on his own, so he believes in his cane. And he follows after his cane. Even though the cane can't see. Right, so he doesn't know if the person... Oh, Zerach, you're watching me. I certainly am. <laughs> you're getting in two directions, yeah. huh? <laughs> no, I don't have But there's no commentary... On yours. You know, like when you listen to a football game and you're at the game, you get the commentary, but here there's nothing. You're like, you're live and you're watching at the same time. <coughs> so, I was just checking to see if it was working. So okay, yeah, it works. Okay, good, good. So, even the blind person who just has a cane, he trusts in his cane. He has faith in that cane, that it's hitting the right places and that he knows how to work with it, and that cane is guiding him, even though the cane doesn't see. At least the first person can see. The cane is an inanimate object. It doesn't even see. And all the more so, a pers- it's fitting for a person to follow after himself. That is to say, in those good old days, when Hashem's light was shining on you a little bit, and back then, it was very easy to serve Hashem, to be strengthened and enthusiastic in your heart for serving Hashem. Because when everything is going well, then it's no problem to say thank you to Hashem. It's when things aren't going well that it's very hard to say thank you to Hashem. So, what do you do? You remember those old times. You use those old times to guide you in inspiring you and, and reviving your energy for serving Hashem. Even though right now you've fallen from that level and you're not able to be as happy as you were back then. And the person's heart and eyes have been closed, are shut. Nonetheless, a person should hold on to those old days and walk behind them, follow after them. So he's saying that the old days when things were good are like your cane. They're like the, blind, they're like the person who can see that you're the blind person and you're holding on to it. And he uses the same word, yochez, to grasp. Tahainu, <clears throat> that is to say, Kamosha azaya mitorer libo litchazek ba'avodato yitbarach. That is to say, <clears throat> just like then, just like then, when you were able to be enthusiastic and strengthened in your service of Hashem, gamkein achshav, so too now, yichazek libo maod, he should strengthen himself greatly, v'yelech achar hayitavavut, and he should go after this enthusiasm, v'azricha shayalo az, and the light that Hashem was, sign, was shining on him then. Even though right now, he's fallen down from that level as mentioned above. Let's say wherever is comfortable. Let's see over there. Until after a few days or a short amount of time, Hashem will help him 
ויחזור ויזריח לו אורו יתברך אמן. And the Shem will once again shine his light on this person. Amen. Okay, so that's the lesson in a nutshell. It says we have to serve Hashem. I'm going to go over the lesson again to share. You'll get to hear the review. It says, okay, we know that we have to serve Hashem b'simcha. Right, it says in Psalm 100, we have to serve Hashem b'simcha, mizmor adoda, we see the moment. So how do you do it? Let's say things aren't going so well. Bank account's not looking so good. Relationships are not looking so good. Your health's not looking so good. Whatever it is, you're frustrated. Maybe you're just angry at people, resentful. Whatever it is, it's very hard to be in a good mood. And then you come across this passage in the davening. And now I'm supposed to serve Hashem b'simcha. Maybe I don't want to serve Hashem with joy. Maybe I want to be angry at Hashem. Maybe I'm not in the mood for being serving Hashem with joy. And that's what he says here. It could be that this person has gotten to the place where his eyes and his heart have been closed. So what do you do? When your eyes and heart are closed, you're like a blind person. When you're in this place that you don't want to serve Hashem, you don't want, like you don't want to do it with joy, you're like a blind person. And what did the blind person do? He held on to his cane. Or he held on to the person that can see. Or he held on to the person who's holding on to the person who can see. And so what can see for you are the times when things were good. When everything was going well. Because everybody, sometime in their life, had a good time. Even if they can say, just when I was a baby, I remember I didn't have any problems. <clears throat> or in university, everything was taken care of for me. Or whatever it was in your life, you think about whatever good time it was. So I actually had this in the shuk the other week. <clears throat> I spent basically all the money I had on Shabbos. Nothing left in my bank account, nothing left coming from anywhere. And I'm spending the last few shekels I have. And I'm feeling kind of depressed because... I say, Hashem, you know, I'm doing this for you, but I don't have anything left. And I'm thinking to myself, but I remember, it wasn't so long ago, like a year or so ago, when I had money coming in all the time. I just go to the ATM and take out money, whatever I needed. Every time I take out money, and there's more money coming in. So I just kept reminding myself about how it felt to be in that situation. And all of a sudden, I was happy again. And I was walking around the shop, and I was making jokes with the vendors, and I was singing a little melody. And I didn't even realize at the time that I was doing exactly what Rabbi Nachman says. That's the way to, to find joy when you feel like your heart and your eyes are closed. And then I remembered this lesson, which is why I wanted to learn this lesson today. <clears throat> and then I said, okay, what's going to be for this Shabbos? I don't have any money for this Shabbos. And all of a sudden, money came in for the Shabbos as well. So that's the lesson. <clears throat> any questions? interesting because you're saying you're down, reflect back to a time when you were not down, you were up. That's, most people actually would reflect back to a time when, and then it would drive them down again, be like, oh, I had it all, and now I lost it all, you know, I don't have anything. Right. So, like, they're depressed and they want to be more depressed. Right. Yeah, I know the feeling. Yes. But that's why we're Hasidim, and that's why we're learning Hasidis, so that the next time it happens to us, we can say, well, I remember when things were good. And you put yourself mentally there, and it raises you up. And that's one of the, the secret lessons of serving Hashem B'Simcha. And any questions before I go on? Okay. I think uh, an essential yeah. component of that is recognizing that you know, things, are change, things are always changing. You know, Hashem has the ability to like, change it back around again instead of being stuck in what you had. I, I agree, it's sometimes depressing to think about what I had before, and how I feel the last even more strongly. But yeah, to reflect on like the changing dynamic and that you know things come and go and then change the control of that. What's interesting also is that I find that whenever you get to that point where then you you know then it always changes in this you know blink of an eye and then you're like what was I so upset about you know? yeah. right yeah. Wasn't yeah. So, you know, I couldn't have, I couldn't have held on for another minute. Sometimes you don't even <laughs> realize that it's changed in both directions. It's very subtle until you're at the top or at the bottom. <laughs> right. I, I was I was wondering if you, if the emphasis there is like, you know, focus on that because things will change again, or even just that in itself, just putting yourself in that state. It's both right, of them. How it was. He says at the end, don't worry because just like they changed for you going down, they're going to change for you going up. Mm -hmm. But that that he says at the end, that's like the last line. 
but earlier he says, just put yourself in that place mentally. Right. Once you're there, you won't feel the pain that you're feeling now. So in the Abraham, it's Lesson 222, where it's the serve of Shemba Simcha. And how do you do it? By holding on to the memory of the good times. Just like a blind person holds on to his cane, or a person that he believes can see. But he believes that it can see, and he believes that the person is going to take him to where he needs to go. So Rabbi Nachman says, you, all, you should hold on to the memory, put yourself in that place, because eventually things are going to turn around. Okay? <clears throat> okay, Rabbi Nachman, putting you aside. We've got um, other Rabbis coming. <clears throat> um, so, before the start. Okay, can you all see me there? So this is, these are two stories from my forthcoming book, the Zat Hashem. <coughs> I'm recording the audio book now. I'm doing like an hour or two hours a day, and so I come across all the stories, and I was reading the story, I said, okay, these two stories are appropriate for the lesson tonight. First one is, they're both short stories. Are you as happy as me? I have two friends who know how to be happy in life. Oftentimes I wonder why I can't be more like them. I'm always a little stressed and high strung, but these two friends, they know how to chill out. One of my friends lives with his mother. He's 35 years old. He has a son and he's divorced. When I asked him recently about his business, he said that things were going well. He told me he stops working every day at four o'clock. I asked him why he doesn't stay open longer. He said there's no need. He makes enough money working until four, so why work more? When I visited him and his mother, he showed me a picture of his son who just got into university. He was proud of his son. This is somebody who I'm not sure finished high school. It's a big deal for his son to go to university. He showed me his room in his mother's house. It was nice and clean. He even had a candle burning when he wasn't there. Then he showed me his pride and joy, his bicycle. It was one of those super light bikes you can lift up with your hand using one finger. Super light, super fast. I asked him how often he uses it, and he said every day. He rides at least 70 miles a week. I thought to myself, how much more does a person need? He has a place to live where he'll never be kicked out. He has a business that makes enough money for him to live. His son is successful in his eyes. He has a clean and organized life and even has a healthy hobby. What more could he ask for in life? I have another friend. He's a little crazy. He's bipolar, and despite his mental disease, he was able to make it through Harvard Medical School and became a doctor. For years, he worked in emergency rooms in America and eventually moved to Jerusalem. That's how we became friends. <coughs> Over time, he went from being one of the most normal and balanced people I knew to being totally crazy and not even sure where he was. I haven't seen him since, but the last time I saw him, he actually had some real words of wisdom for me. I asked him how he was doing, and he told me he was doing great. He was standing in the middle of the shuk, drinking a beer, not looking so great, but certainly happy. I told him I was concerned about him. It was clear that either he wasn't taking his medication or that the medication he was taking wasn't doing the job. And I'm sure that drinking beer wasn't helping. But when I asked him how he's doing, he said he had his beer and his friends. He had clothes, food, and a roof over his head. What more could he ask for in life? And then he said to me, <clears throat> You know what, Barak? I'm actually concerned about you. How are you doing? Are you as happy as me? Can you tell me that you're as content as me, sitting here with my beer, enjoying my life? <clears throat> it actually got me thinking. Am I as happy as my crazy drunk friend? <laughs> it reminds me of the story you probably know, about the guy who's sitting by the, the lake fishing. Every day he catches a lot of fish. Eventually, somebody who's been watching him comes over and says, why don't you sell that fish in the marketplace? You can keep some of the fish for yourself, and the rest you'll make some money from. So the guy who's fishing said to the other guy, then what? The other guy said, well, after you, finish a little bit, after you make a little bit of money, you can hire some people, and they'll also fish. Then you can take the fish that you caught and the fish that they caught, and you make a bigger profit. And the guy who's fishing said, and then what? Well, then you buy a boat and catch even more fish. And then what? Asked the fisherman. <clears throat> well, after that, you buy some more boats and eventually build a factory and you make a fortune. And then what? Asked the fisherman. Well, then you have all the money you need. 
And then what? asked the fisherman. Well, then you can do anything you want. And the fisherman answers, You mean like sitting here by the lake fishing? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes life feels like a paradox. I work and struggle to make money so that I can have the freedom to do what I want. But maybe I don't really need so much money to do what I want. I've thought about my two friends many times. Why am I not like them? I put myself in their shoes many times and tried to imagine what it would be like if I just had a room and a little business and rode my bike 70 miles a week, or had a beer and was just happy with what I had. Some people aren't just happy to relax and appreciate what God has given them. Some people are like me and need more. We need to feel like we're part of something big and making an impact on the world. And people like me are really happiest when they're doing something. Every person is different and everyone has different needs. Every time I put myself in my friend's shoes, I see how frustrated I get. But the thought of their happiness and serenity brings me comfort. Maybe one day I'll get there myself. So that's the first story. About my two friends, my crazy friend. Who I do see every now and then still in the show. <coughs> okay, one more short story. <coughs> then we'll play little Nigun, and then I've got one of my favorite Hasidic stories for you. <clears throat> We're doing okay time wise. I fell into a pit. <clears throat> the other day I fell into a pit. Not metaphorically. I actually fell into a pit dug by <laughs> Arab workers in front of my house. <laughs> the pit was over six feet deep. I know because I'm 5'11 and I was literally in over my head. The workers had to pull me out of the pit, injured and really upset. I came home with a trolley full of food from the shuk, and to my utter surprise, found that the pedestrian street where I lived had been torn up. The stairs were gone, and there was a huge tractor blocking the way to get into my house. I looked at the workers and said, what the hell is this? Go around, they told me. I can't go around. I live right here, I said, pointing to my door. <laughs> no problem, they said. You jump over the pit into your courtyard, and we'll hand you your groceries. By the end of the day, the pit will be filled in, and you can leave your house. I wasn't happy about this at all. I don't jump over pits. Maybe when I was a kid, but not as an adult. But they didn't give me a choice. So I climbed up onto the mound of dirt and mud which covered what used to be the stairs to my house. I wanted to prepare to jump, but promptly slid into the pit instead. Within half a second, I was standing injured in this huge pit. I yelled at the workers that they were idiots and tried to get out on my own. It was too deep and full of wet mud. They had to pull me out. My leg had already swollen so much I could hardly walk. I opened the door to my house, cursing out the workers, and still in shock what had just happened. I was so angry that I told my wife never to let me get a gun because I would have <laughs> shot the workers if I had one. I wouldn't have really shot them, but I was so angry at what happened, I felt like I could hardly control myself. Eventually, my foot swelled so much that I couldn't keep my shoe on. I know what you're thinking. Lawsuit. Forget about a lawsuit. I live in Jerusalem. It would be an endless battle against the city and nothing would come of it. That's part of the cost of living here. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. I was exhausted and went to sleep. A few hours later, I had to go work to, to my office to work. I looked outside and nothing had changed. I was determined to get to my office, so I jumped over the pit with my good leg. Then with the workers helping me, I was back on the street again. I limped to work, wanting to treat myself to an my injured self to a nice meal. There was a fish restaurant that I hadn't been to in a while. It wasn't so far from my office, so I limped my way over. It sounds crazy, but that's how I am. I do stupid things like this. When I finally got there, to my shock and dismay, I saw that the restaurant was gone, replaced by another. What the hell, I said to myself. <laughs> really, what else could go wrong today? Now I was really upset. I'd fallen into a stupid pit. Then I dragged my injured self for some comfort food and the restaurant was gone. Having no other option, I started limping back to my office. I recalled a lesson from Rabbi Nachman that I'd given over many times at a Shabbos table. He said you have to love the bad things that come your way. Love the troubles and afflictions that come your way because they are your troubles and afflictions, custom made for you to help you grow and become a better person. Rabbi Nachman said that you have to accept them with love. What a concept. I decided it was time to walk my walk and said out loud, Hashem, I accept being thrown in the pit with love. 
I kept repeating it out loud. Not too loud, I didn't want people to think I was crazy, but loud enough for it to sink in. I accept my troubles and afflictions with love. Thank you, God, for throwing me into a pit. Thank you, God, for my swollen leg and foot. Somehow, I'm not really sure how, I released my anger towards the workers. I saw them over the next few days, and I really didn't hold a grudge against them. The more I started to think about it, I thought, who threw me into that pit? It wasn't the workers. Yes, they were negligent, not covering the pit or taking any precautions, but they didn't throw me into the pit. Hashem threw me into the pit. He's also the one who pulled me out. The same God that put me into the pit took me out. <clears throat> Welcome. Yeah, it's great. Always good. Whenever you come, it's good. The second story was called. I fell into a pit. I fell into a pit. Mm-hmm. So, Rabbi Yisrael Sadegor, he was a Rebbe for a short amount of time, because unfortunately, he didn't live to, live to be, be very old, so he didn't have a lot of time to be a Rebbe. And he also didn't have a lot of Hasidim, but he had one Hasid whose name was Moshe. And Moshe was a big businessman. Uh, there's two types of businessmen which I don't know from personal experience, just know from the news, not fake news. news. (laughs) There's the business business people, businessmen, who have real money, and the ones that kind of not really have money. They just know how to make a big smoke uh, smoke screen. Smoke and mirrors. Yeah. So maybe once they had money, then they lost money, and uh, still everyone respects them, and they've got their fancy stuff, but there's nothing in the bank account. This guy, Moshe, was the second type. He seemed like he was rich, but he didn't really have any money. <clears throat> and slowly, his uh, creditors started figuring out that he didn't actually have any money. And they told him, listen, you've got to pay up. You borrowed a lot of money. You've got to pay up. And he's trying to figure out where he's going to get all this money from. 
And even if he sold all his possessions, it wasn't going to be enough. And at the same time, he gets a letter from his Rebbe, Rebbe Yisrael and Sadegor. And his Rebbe says to him, I need 2,000 rubles to marry off poor brides. Now this guy, Moshe, that he owed 2,000 rubles to the bank. So he figured, what, is this a coincidence? My Rebbe asked me for 2,000 rubles, and the bank wants 2,000 rubles. I can only collect 2,000 rubles, no matter what I do. So I'm going to collect the money for the Rebbe, and everything's going to be fine. He's a tzaddik. Everything's going to work out. He tells his wife, we have nothing to worry about. Everything's going to be fine. I'm going to go collect the 2,000 rubles, give it to the Rebbe. He's going to give me a bracha, and everything's going to work out. <clears throat> so instead of taking care of his business problems, he goes around. He's got 14 days to bring the money to the Rebbe and 14 days to pay off his debts. He comes back on the 13th day after collecting money, collects the 2,000 rubles, and he goes to his house, and the house is empty. The door is locked, and he realizes that his wife and kids have been kicked out while he was away. So he sees them <clears throat> out on the street. They had no place to go. And his wife is really distraught. And he says, don't worry. I collected the 2,000 rubles. Everything's going to be fine. We're going to go to the Rebbe. He's going to give us a bracha, and my fortune's going to come back. So in the meantime, they had to find a place to live. <clears throat> They asked around, nobody wanted to help him. You know, when, they thought, when people thought he was rich, everyone was his best friend. Now he's got nothing, nobody wanted to help him. There was one chassid, he had a farm. He said, you can't come into my house, but you can go to the barn. So they move all the furniture and all their possessions into the barn. And as they're sleeping at night, there's a four-alarm fire, and it comes and burns down the barn with everything in it. And they were lucky to get out with just the pajamas that they were wearing. <clears throat> But this chassid, he got out, he kept, he had the money under his pillow, so he still had the 2,000 rubles, and he said to his wife, we'd have nothing to worry about. Everything's going to be fine. We're going to go to the Rebbe, he's going to give me a bracha, and everything's going to be fine. So he borrows a, a coat, and he goes to the Rebbe, <clears throat> and he walks into the Sadigor, and the Rebbe doesn't even look up, and Moshele puts the money on the table, the Rebbe doesn't even look, and so pushes the money under the Rebbe's face, because the Rebbe was sitting there and learning. The Rebbe sees it, counts the money, and doesn't even look at Moshe Lee, says, thank you very much. <clears throat> so Moshe Lee is about to leave, no bracha, no nothing. The Rebbe does, doesn't understand, and he figures, I'm going to leave, but he, he also, then he said to himself, I'm never coming back here again. So I might as well tell the Rebbe what I really think. He said, Rebbe, you're not a real Rebbe, you're a fake Rebbe. Fake news, fake Rebbe. <laughs> Not a real Rebbe, you're a fake Rebbe. If you were a real Rebbe, you'd know the pain that I went through and that my, my family has nothing and that we were in a barn and it burned down in the fire and now I'm really left with nothing. I, I don't even own this coat. It doesn't even belong to me. What kind of Rebbe are you? You know what it took to raise this money and you don't even give me a bracha. The Sadigur says to Rebbe Moshele, sit down, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story in a story. It's like a bargain. You know, Jews like a bargain. It's a good deal. Two for one. Two for one. We're going to get even more. Like we're even deeper. He says, my grandfather, the Holy Rishoner, he had a chassid whose name was Yosef. And Yosef had the same problem as you. Lost all of his money. Everything burned down. He came and he brought the money to my, great, to my grandfather, the Holy Rishoner. And the, the same scene that happened right here. So since it happened to my grandfather, and he told me this story, I'm going to tell you the story that my grandfather, the originator, told to his chassid yesterday. So now we get a story and a story. So the originator had a chassid, his name was Mendel David. And Mendel David was a really a big businessman. He was like the first time, the first, the first type. He actually had money. And he had this crazy little bug in his head. He never took credit. Not that he didn't take credit for doing things, but you're blocking Shira. So move back a little bit. <clears throat> um, he, didn't borrow, he never borrowed money. So since he was a merchant and he had to go to fairs, he would buy millions of rubles of merchandise. He had all the money in cash. He would never take anything on a loan. That was his deal, which is a great thing, by the way. I, I, I have a few businesses, and if you can... If you have the money, you don't take credit. It's a lot better than taking credit. But, so that was his thing. 
So what do you do back then? There were no credit cards, no banks, right? Not banks like we have now. So he kept all the money in a lockbox. It was this iron box, and he had a business partner who was his accountant, and the two of them shared watching the box. So they were traveling to, traveling to Leipzig, which was the big fair, where they would buy their merchandise for the entire year, with millions of rubles in this lockbox. And just before they got to Leipzig, there's this beautiful park, and they decide they're going to take a break, and they get out, and of course they take the box with them, and they put it in, deep in, in the grass there, it's really tall grass, and they lay down, and they're looking at the sun, and they're enjoying the view, and they're saying, isn't it wondrous what Hashem can create? And they both fall asleep, and then they wake up, <clears throat> they realize it's late, they gather their things, they quickly run back to their carriage, and head into Leipzig before the sun sets. And they're there for like two months, two months making deals, working everything out, and now it's time to pay. So Mendel David, he turns to his partner, the accountant, and he says, okay, I want you to pay this much to this merchant and this much to this merchant, and the accountant says, wait a minute, you want me to pay? I don't have the lockbox, you have the lockbox. He said, what do you mean? I don't have it, you have it. Then they realized they left it somewhere, and they probably left it in the park that two months ago they were visiting. So they realized they couldn't buy anything. All the merchants there, though, knew Mendel David and his, and his business partner. So they had no problem lending them whatever they wanted on credit. And Mendel David said, out of principle, I never take anything on credit, and I won't now. So having no money and no choice, they decided they were going to go back to the park and just, you know, enjoy the view before they go back to their lives of poverty. And as they lay down in the field, in the same spot that they were before, Mendel David's head hits the lockbox. It was there for two months. No one saw it. <clears throat> they open it up, and all the money's there. So the accountant, he's couldn't be happier. He's dancing for joy. He said, there's still time. We can go back and buy all the merchandise and everything is fine. And Mendel David, he was just depressed. It was like Tisha B'Av for him. <clears throat> he starts crying and he's weeping and he opens the box and takes out half the money and gives it to his friend, the accountant, the business partner. And he says, go, get out of here. I don't ever want to see you again. Go and be successful. Just, I don't want to be with you anymore. And he doesn't understand. <clears throat> the accountant, he leaves. And Mendel David, he goes back home. Mendel David, he has nothing. So what does he do? He becomes a beggar. And, you know, when you used to be a rich man, and now you're a beggar, it's not so easy to beg. Because <clears throat> as we all know, living in Jerusalem, if you're not aggressive, you're not going to get any money. It's the aggressive beggars that do well. And here's Mendel David, the previous rich man, who's now a beggar. So how did he go around begging? He would cover his face like this. And he put out the cup and say, can you give a little money for a poor Jew? He never looked anyone in the eye. He was totally embarrassed. Shy and embarrassed. It was just the worst, worst humiliation for him. But he realized he wasn't going to get any money like this. <clears throat> so he had to join the union. There was a beggar's union in his town. And they would distribute the funds. Everybody had a different part of town. Everyone would collect. And they would be distributed by seniority. So they decided that they were going to play a little game. They pretended to be kind to Mendel David. But they were sending him to one of the richest people in town that never gave any money to anyone. So they said to him, listen, Mendel David, you're new here. We're giving you the best part of town. We're giving you the richest part of town. We want you to go to this address, knock on the door, to take good care of you. So Mendel David, he heads over, and he knocks on the door, and he puts out his stack of boxes and says, can you give a little money to a poor Jew? And the, the man who opens the door, he says, you look like you, you could use something to drink. You want to come in and drink some tea? Mendel David, without looking up the whole time, he says, yeah, sure. He hasn't had a warm drink in months. <clears throat> so he comes in, and he gives him some tea, and then the owner of the house, he says, would you mind eating lunch with us? 
Mendel David hasn't had like a real meal in months. He said, yeah, please, if you, I, I would love it, please. The whole time he's like this, never picks up his head, never looks at it. They stick the soup under his face, he eats it. And all the food they put under, he eats it without looking up. The rich man puts a gold coin in his hand and he says to him, listen, please come back tomorrow. I'll feed you again. So he comes back, Mendel David comes back to the beggars union and he says, look guys, I did really well, thank you, it's so nice of you. And they couldn't believe it because all of them had tried to get money out of this rich man and he never gave them any money. <clears throat> so, of course, they found a way to steal the coin from him. And Mendel David, being so innocent, he thought he had lost the coin, but he went back the next day. The next day was Thursday, the same thing happened, and the, the owner of the house, he said, listen, come here tomorrow for Shabbos, for Friday night, and after Shabbos, I want you to spend Shabbos with me, after Shabbos, I'll give you 100 gold coins. So he comes back to the beggars union, and he tells them, listen, he invited me for Shabbos, and he's going to give me 100 gold coins, Motsu Shabbos. These guys, they were eating themselves up. They couldn't believe it. 100 gold coins, it's a fortune. And from the guy that never gave to anyone before, this is total insanity. So they came up with a plan. What do the beggars do? They don't have a house. But comes Friday, the mikvah's open, and they can go there and sit in the mikvah with soap, and it's hot, and they get to bathe themselves, and they sit there for hours, having a great time. Mendel David, he sees that it's getting closer to Shkia, it's getting closer to the sun setting, and he wants to get out of the mikvah, and he realizes that somebody took his clothes. He's looking around, can't believe it. So he jumps back in the mikvah. But the guy who takes care of the mikvah, he's got to lock it. And he sees Mendel Dove, and he says, get out! And Mendel Dove says, I can't get out, my clothes are missing. He said, I don't care, get out, i got to lock it. So he pulls Mendel David out, shoves him out the gate, locks it, and goes on his way. <clears throat> so Mendel David, he goes and runs behind a tree, and he's trying to figure out what's he going to do. Friday night, the rich man, he's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting, no Mendel David. So he says to his oldest son, go next door and ask their friend, the other rich family, who also has a beggar at their house, where is Mendel David? Where, he didn't know his name at the time. Where is, where is the baker? So the son goes over and this baker says, ah, he's probably still floating in the mikvah where we left him. So he comes back and tells his father. And his father says, what? They killed him? Maybe he drowned in the mikvah? Quick, we have to run. Go see what happened to him. So, so the rich man and his son, they run down to the mikvah and they see Mendel David start naked, dancing around the tree, singing at the top of his lungs. And they quickly take, the rich man quickly takes his coat and puts it on Mendel David, and they walk him back to the house, get him cleaned up, give him some clothes, and the whole meal, Mendel David is like this. All three meals on Shabbos. <clears throat> the whole time the rich man tries to get him to remove his arm, he won't look at anyone, he's totally embarrassed. So comes Moshe Shabbos, and the rich man, he says to Mendel David, I'm going to give you a hundred gold coins like I promised you, but you have to remove your hand and look at me. So he removes his hand, and he realizes that the rich man was his old business partner, the accountant. And he says, Mendel David, the whole time I've been trying to get you to see me, but I didn't want to embarrass you anymore. So I didn't tell you. But now I can't take it anymore. He said, Here, here's the hundred gold coins. He said, let me tell you what happened. <clears throat> when the two of us split, I kept making investment after investment. This is the, the rich man speaking. And I became so wealthy. I became ten times wealthier than I ever have been before. Please, I want to share my wealth with you. But you have to tell me two things. One... Why, when we found the money back in the park, were you crying like it was Tisha B'Av? And why, when we found you last night, besides the mikvah, you were dancing naked around the tree? So Mendel David says, <clears throat> back then when we were in the park and we found the money, I realized that we had reached the top of the wheel. Life has a wheel. There's a wheel of, of when things are going well, 
and when things are going bad. And I reached, we were, I realized we were at the top. To find that money after two months, that for sure was the top. And I didn't want to bring you down with me. I knew that I was heading all the way down. So I took half the money and I gave it to you and I said, get out of here. I don't ever want to see you again because I didn't want you to have any of my problems. He said, but when I found myself stark naked, dance, standing behind a tree, I realized, could it get any worse than this? <laughs> no, this is it. I finally reached the bottom and Hashem is going to bring me up. Finally. So I started dancing around the tree. <laughs> And the wealthy man, his old business partner, he said, here, I want you to take half the money because half this money is rightfully yours. You gave it to me and if you hadn't given it to me and, and hadn't sent me on my way, I might have shared the same fate as you. So the originer who was telling the story told it to his chassid, Yosele, and the sadegor who was telling it to his chassid, Moshele, he said, Moshele, why do you think I asked you to collect the 2,000 rubles. And why do you think I asked Hashem to burn down the barn with all of your possessions in it? Because it was decreed in heaven that for 10 years you were just going to slowly go down. But I brought you all the way down to the bottom. So now you can only go up. And not only that, I'm giving you a blessing that you should be taken off the wheel and only go higher and higher and higher. So sing the original Nigun in the honor of the original.
Tzitzit, Ezat Hashem, tell your friends. Same time, same, same channel. Same that channel.